flattery. The Lord saw through it immediately and knew exactly what their game was. They start, of course, in the classic way. We know this and that. Just flattery after flattery. And then, Master, what is your opinion? The trap was laid. Of course, the answer has come down through history and is still quoted. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. It applies to us. I remember being warned about this years ago in formation in France, quoting the scripture, Parce anime tue, be merciful to your soul. Unfortunately, the illness is out there now in both the priesthood and the consecrated life in general. People who do many things all the time and non-stop for God, but neglect their inner life. It's the spiritual disease of activism, activism of which Pope Benedict spoke with some intensity, warning the church of the world against it, because it leads, what he says, to hardening of the heart. And that's a disease that even the Holy Spirit can't get through. He can't make his gentle voice heard. We're all in hard mode, getting through things at high speed, fighting deadlines. Does that sound familiar? We don't have to be fighting deadlines until death. Death comes uninvited and unexpected in its own time, and sometimes when we're least expecting it. The month of November is a time to think of that. Something quaint happened to me actually this week in the cemetery. I was quite taken aback. As you know, the hermitage is just about within what would have been the monastery of Julie. The front gate is the external extreme of the monastery enclosure. You can see that quite clearly from the air. And in the monastery, the old monastery, you have these tombs. Some actually quite recent. And I had a treatment with me this week who's big into the Holy Souls and insisted that every day we went with a lit candle and prayed in the evening in the graveyard for the Holy Souls. And so we did and we sang and this happened out of the blue. This person I know has gifts and perceives things which I wouldn't and as I sang the old antiphon in Latin for the deceased, I am the resurrection and the life, I finished it with what would conclude that, but I did so by instinct in the ancient mode. Now I'll try and explain. When the priest goes up to the altar in the old rite, after the prayers at the foot of the altar, he goes, he kisses the altar, and then he goes to the missal and says the introit. But in the normal way, it is starting with another sign of the cross, as he does so. The exception being the requiem. There, he goes and starts off with this sign. Requiem eternam dona eis domine. It looks at, and then he goes with the antiphon. But that's the difference, as though he's blessing the dead. And by instinct, a priest, who is anyway in that tradition, even young priests sometimes were aware of it, I've seen it, when they pass a grave or a cemetery, will not make this sign, but will make this sign and say that prayer. And it has, it seems, an effect upon them. That prayer is indulgence even for you, actually. It still maintains that indulgence when you say eternal rest, God of them, or Lord, and so on. If you say that, for instance, when the clock is striking, every hour you can gain an indulgence each time. Now, that's just to explain what happened. I therefore made this sign as I sang that prayer. And this other person, out of the blue, picked something up and said with insistence, she knew it and felt it. I don't get these things, but she said this, that at the moment you made this sign of the cross, something came to me, and she felt it clearly. A huge number of holy souls were saying, 
and she couldn't possibly have known why. And I explained to her, look, every Tuesday throughout my life, I always say the Holy Mass for the Holy Souls in Purgatory. And also I do this every hour, this prayer, and other things, the Office of the Dead, I still use a little bit in the Hermitage. So I try to explain to her, perhaps you're hearing something that I wouldn't hear, but it was consoling. And what hit us was this, how thin the frontier is, which brings me to when I want to land. I also explained to her that when I was in formation in France, we had this holy priest who already in 1936 was there, he'd been ordained before the war, and therefore he was of the old school. And he told us this secret among priests. If you really want something, say the Holy Mass for the Holy Souls. And of course, it's bound to have an effect, because they kind of ask, who did that down there? As soon as they're out there, they pour that person with blessings and graces which they infiltrate from heaven, because they're so grateful. They never let themselves be outdone in generosity. Remember that. So, the moment of truth, it comes sometimes very early in life. This happens to be in Britain, Remembrance Sunday, the Sunday closest to Armistice Day, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 11 o'clock in the morning on the 11th of November, when the guns, which had not ceased except on Christmas Day, stopped forever in the trenches. And so there's still every Sunday close to that day in Britain, throughout the land, two minutes of silence observed. We will remember them. It's actually quite moving. When you hear the bugle at the memorial, the last post, and you think, all these young men, young men, young men. I was talking to somebody this morning who spent two years of her youth when she was in her teens or just after in America working. She could have found a husband in America. But at that time, as she put it, there wasn't a man in sight. They were all in the Vietnam War. And do you know that a song was written and went round America at that time called 19? Just 19. It was the age of the average soldier going to Vietnam. But we had it too. We were all hit by it in Britain. The flower of youth disappeared in the Great War. We never really recovered. But Ireland too was involved. Listen to this. The first Catholic chaplain killed in action on the Western Front was Father Gwyn, a Jesuit. Before the war, he had been stationed in Dublin. And when he volunteered for active service, he was appointed as chaplain to the Irish Guards. More than one of the war correspondents has described how before going forward in a charge, you know what they used to do, over the top, over the top, to almost certain death. The Irish guards would kneel, notice, for a few moments in prayer. Now, if you ever find yourself in Belfast, you can wander into St Anne's Anglican Cathedral, and if you go walking around, you will see a remembrance of the war, the Great War, and you'll see a picture of the young, young Irish troops kneeling just in front of explosions, which is going to take them into the beyond. They're all on their knees, ready to go. So he started this. The Irish guards would kneel for a few moments in prayer. It was Father Gwynne who introduced the custom and then knelt for his absolution. He was wounded in the attack on the brick fields near La Basse 
on the 1st of February 1915. The wound was not serious, and in half an hour he had had it dressed and was back among his men. A few weeks later he met his death in another attack on the German trenches. An Irish guard writes, I saw him just before he died. Shrapnel and bullets were being showered upon us on all directions. Hundreds of our lads dropped. Father Gwyn was undismayed. He seemed to be all over the place trying to give the last sacraments to the dying. Once I thought he was buried alive, for a shell exploded within a few yards of where he was. And the next moment I saw nothing but a great heap of earth. The plight of the wounded concealed beneath was harrowing. Out of the ground came cries of, Father, 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 from those who are in their death agonies. Then, as if by a miracle, notice this bit, as if by a miracle, Father Gwyn was seen to fight his way through the earth. He must have been severely injured, but he went on blessing the wounded and hearing their confessions. The last I saw of him was kneeling, notice this bit, by the side of a German soldier. He must have been killed immediately after this act of priestly charity to a fallen opponent. I could go on, but this is not an isolated case. This last week we had the feast of the newly canonised Elizabeth of, of the Trinity, who was beatified in 1984 on the same day as the founder of a good work in France, who had been sent to the battlefields by the bishop. But he had made this pact with Thérèse of Lisieux, who died not that long before in his opportunity, both very young. One was 24, the other was 26. And he said to Thérèse of Lisieux, who at that time was just becoming known as a great protectress, the soldier son would have a picture in their pouch in the trenches and would pray to her for protection. And he said to this saint, not yet canonized, Garde moi celui-ci, j'en ai besoin. Keep me this one, I need him. He was a priest of value. And he would go and do exactly the same thing, jumping over the trenches, anywhere where somebody died, he would be there. And the soldiers noticed the bullets were always going round him. Nothing hit him in those four years. They always miraculously went round his body because the Lord wanted him to bear these souls for death. And only when he got back to his bishop did he learn what the bishop had done. Young death. This last week, a young girl jumped off the bridge at Blanchett's town on to the highway underneath and was instantly killed. Life which could have gone on and led to many children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, but truncated and, as it were, thrown back to the Creator. I don't need it. This happens to be also being offered as a celebration for the soul of somebody who would have every Sunday nearly sat just there at the back, and you know who I mean. He wasn't yet 40, but he, our dear friend Ray, had many graces, especially in the last period of his life. I knew him very well, and I used to say things to him when he got the message. Ray, we need the oomph factor, and he would have it, and he would do things for Jesus and Mary. He was very much involved with Mary. He would involve everyone in anything that was going along with our Blessed Lady, and he would organise things 
Marian processions, rosaries in the street, organise them first and then, and only then, tell the Gardaí it was happening. And they would protect. And people would come along. It would grow like a snowball. There's faith out there still in this area. We have a very good team of priests, five of them I think, and adoration now for about 30 years or more, non-stop, day and night, graces in the air. And people aren't aware of this, but things happen with regard to Ray. He went to Jesus unexpectedly because he thought he was getting better. On the very anniversary of his own grandmother, whom he himself, in a sense, had prepared for death. He, like his grandmother, for whom also this mass is being offered, Emily, had a great love for Our Lady of Fatima and Our Lady of Locke. Notice Our Lady of Locke. They both died on the feast day of Our Lady of Locke. And as his grandmother was dying, he was next to her and sang gently in her ear the hymn of Our Lady of Locke. I was deeply moved when exactly a year later he went out of the church where we'd had the funeral and without any applause, without any noise or humanity as it were, Our Lady was in the midst and we sang very emotionally Our Lady of Nark. And he went to join his grandmother, who I'm sure was waiting to meet him on the shore. Here he is, you can see him just reading sacred scripture, which he had a great devotion to. What I want to leave you with is this, my friends. He also knew how to get graces from heaven. And those graces also came on others and sometimes could be visible. Do you know that when he was just put in the ground, a dove, because remember how the dove is the sign of Our Lady of Fatima, that's why we always see the doves beneath Our Lady of Fatima, the military of the doves. A dove wouldn't budge from his body for ten minutes. Just a coincidence. Just a coincidence. I leave you with this. He, like many, died young. He will never grow old. There is a blissfulness in dying young because we will always remember a young man in the fullness of life. Many grow old in their soul. Even before they're old, they're wrinkled in their soul. Let's appreciate youth and not grow old. One day is enough to conquer eternity with, for us and for those we meet. So I'll just quote this and hand it to you. I will never grow old. And by the way, there's a play on his name, Ray, in this. What tis to die, what tis to lie in peace with neither grey nor wrinkle, twinkling, a eh, in memories eh, to be. Where here will cease the shriveling of plucked days. What is to say, sorry, what is to stay forever and a day upon a page of youth and beaming court? What is to cry at the aeons, come no more, nor bid me age or wilt with your long wearing. I will die, and in a breath blow out the hours that kill 
the beauty of a face. I will one rain have glimmer in the train of days that still I would perhaps have walked for end of day for me at noon would fall. But I gave all with pierced lung the young 